All right. Well, then I'm going to get started, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning on Inauguration Day. Uh, Dr. Williams is at a meeting, so I'm uh, in charge this morning. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Penniston. We are incredibly fortunate to have her as part of our department as she is a national expert on the dietary aspects of stone disease. I didn't know this, actually. She's been the dietitian associated with the Metabolic Stone Clinic here, I'm guessing since its inception, but since 1999. Is that right? Um, well, actually, it was started in 1995, but so okay. I came on board later. So not quite since its inception. Um, with over 80 publications to her name and probably, I'm assuming, a similar number of research mentees uh, uh, who have graduated under her tutelage, she's an incredible resource for us here at the department. And uh, a recent role uh, that she has just assumed um, is with the CARIBOO program. So CARIBOO, which is C-A-I-R-I-B-U, stands for Collaborating for the Advancement of Interdisciplinary Research in Benign Urology. So this is, um, uh, so Dr. Penniston received a five-year award from the NIDDK to establish a coordinating center or an interactions core for 17 urology programs and centers across the country. So that includes O'Brien centers, of which UW is one, the P20 exploratory centers, and K-12 urology career development programs. And so the goal of this is to create, a, 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 the goal of this interactions core, which she is uh, leading, uh, is to promote networking and scientific collaboration among benign urology researchers in these organizations and throughout the country. So again, just an amazing resource, resource for us to have here. And so without further ado, she's going to start her lecture on the dietary influences on kidney stones. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you very much. That was very nice. Um, and if anybody wants to check out what Caribou is, um, you, we do have a website. And I should have listed it here, but it's caribou, spelled that weird way, <laughs> at urology.wisc.edu. And you can find out more about it there. <clears throat> thank you. So um, I'm just going to... I don't get the opportunity to show my slides in their animated form because I put some animations in here. But anyway, um, it's not working. So I'll just kind of move forward. Um, we all know that there is a biochemical basis for nutrition therapy for stones. And Dr. Best talked about this last week really nicely. So we know that there's a, a biochemical basis for the formation of a crystal that's called supersaturation in urine. And then at all these different places where I've put the arrows, there are dietary influences that can affect crystallization process, the growth, the aggregation, and so forth. So there's a real biochemical basis for this. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm showing some um, the most common urinary parameters that, that, are, uh, that give rise to stone disease. And, of course, we have supersaturated urine. And then, of course, there's hypercalciuria, hyperoxaluria, hypocitraturia, hypomagnesuria, and overly acidic urine. Um, hey, now, Chris, I'm that, sorry please. to interrupt yeah. you. We are not. Yes. We see your saw your first slide, but not. We haven't. We can't see anything now. So it's the same problem I had before, and I'm just. I can see on my on my screen, so I don't know what the problem is. Darn it! And now the common urinary risk factors and causes just popped up. It seems like there's just a delay. Wow, a long one. Okay, well I'll try to keep that in mind. Maybe I'll okay. I'll foreshadow. Yeah my slides here. Okay. Anyway, so on the left-hand side, you see all these urinary parameters. And then in the middle, you see what are the potential dietary contributors that give rise to each one of those parameters. And then on the far right, you see other contributors, which are not uh, nutrition-related at all. And this is really important. And you'll hear me hearken to this all through the talk, which is to say that stones are not always caused by diet. So if we're looking for a dietary cause for all stones, it's not going to be there. And the unfortunate reality then is, is that in those cases, no amount of dietary change is going to reduce a person's risk for recurrence of stones. In other words, if we don't diagnose appropriately that the person's stones uh, may or may not be caused by diet, then we don't really know how to go forward with therapy. Um, I have no idea if you're seeing that screen now, which I changed to, which says diet doesn't cause or contribute to people's stones. No, darn it. There's a real delay here. It's probably my internet, huh? Um, let me try to close out a couple of other windows and see if that makes any difference.
just on the theory that it might. Anyway, so I'll just keep moving on. Um, so nutrition therapy is, um, she's saying, would stopping their video feeds? I have no idea if, if anything on your end is going to help. I'll just keep moving forward here. Um, so nutrition therapy is the process of applying uh, nutrition-related therapy to uh, a person's stone disease. And the first thing, of course, that we want to try to do is assess whether diet contributes. And uh, it's really helpful for a dietitian to do this because otherwise um, I don't know that it's possible to get to the bottom of it, especially when you are seeing patients for minutes at a time, sometimes 10 minutes max. Uh, but there is a, a role for diet if you can find one in, in the diet. And then if you determine that diet contributes, then you want to apply uh, intervention to the risk factors that you think are a causing or giving rise to a person's stones. And then, of course, if, if you deem that diet is not contributory, then perhaps you would look at pharmacological or some other sort of therapy. Can you see any of that slide? It's like a, no, a flow chart? It's just a white screen right now. I, I, it would it be speedy? Can you send your slides to either Denise and I? We might be able to run them for you. Yeah, we could give that a try. Okay. Um, yes, I just closed out my email. But let me get back to that and hopefully can try to do that. Um, I'll use my personal email because I think I can get to that faster. It's probably Belleville Internet. What do you think, Denise? We both maybe that's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> and you could try turning your video off, Chris. That's the other. That's probably more effective than us turning ours off. Gotcha. Well, while we're waiting, um, I can update the history. So the Stone Clinic started in 1995 with Fran Kittel, uh, Dick Rieselbach's dietary person. Chris joined the clinic in 99 and the department in 2005, I think. Yes. I can't get to my email, so it's got to be something on my end. Um, I cut off my video. We can see something now. We can see it. Is it like a, a flow chart? Yeah. It is a flow chart. Okay. Well, that's what I was just talking about, so let me move on. So um, let me talk about nutrition therapy. You probably can't see this slide now either. I just changed it. But the question I'm asking is, does nutrition therapy work? And I think this is a valid question to ask because there is a lot of evidence for it in diabetes and, of course, in nutrition-related deficiency diseases um, and preventive cardiology and other diseases as well. But to be really honest, there is lot, there's much less evidence for the role of nutrition therapy in the recurrence of stones. And I, I, I often sometimes think that the problem is, well, stones are multifactorial. Um, there's many different causes for stones, so it's difficult to isolate, you know, one or two causes. But also I think that sometimes our studies that we look at um, to evaluate whether diet plays a role in prevention of stones are somewhat polluted. And what I mean by that is if you look at these two um, uh, barrels that are that are pummeling water or stuff into this river here, think of one barrel as patients whose stones are caused by diet. And think of the other one as patients whose stones are not caused by diet. When we then try to look in the river and see, well, did nutrition therapy for all of those patients work? Well, of course it's not going to work for the patients whose stones were not caused by diet because we didn't apply the right therapy. And so I sometimes I wonder if maybe we're not um, designing our studies appropriately. It's very hard to do. Nutrition is very hard to study, as you know. So um, I think that's a conundrum that we have to deal with. But I would say the evidence is still out. The jury's still out on whether nutrition therapy works um, in all patients. Uh, but I think in some, there's definitely evidence that, that it does. And so one of the reasons I think that is, and this has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about in terms of applying nutrition therapy, is kidney stones are not all the same. And I often, when I'm describing this to non-urologists, I talk about um, being uh, analogous to anemia. We all know that anemia is a problem where there's too few blood cells, Everybody who has it has reduced blood oxygen flow. They all get tired. They all have the same symptoms, but underlying causes can be very different. And if you don't apply the right fix to a person's anemia, obviously you're not going to get resolution. So if I tell somebody with pernicious anemia, which is either B12 or folate deficiency, if I tell them to start supplementing with iron, their anemia is not going to be solved. So in stones, I think of it kind of the same way. We have this common uh, uh, symptom, which is calculi. People have pain from it. You, you, you know all that. But if we don't treat the correct underlying cause, which could be a renal issue or a GI issue or a medication issue or diet, 
then of course we're not going to um, have any result in terms of preventing its recurrence. So what I want to do now for the rest of the time is to identify some of those common urinary risk factors and particularly talk about um, how diet affects those. And then, of course, talk about uh, ways to, to fix that with diet, um, if you do deem that diet is appropriate, and then some suggestions for how to counsel patients. So in the first scenario, what we, we know that supersaturation of urine gives rise to crystal formation. And this, of course, is due to low urine volume, especially in the context of high solutes, so high calcium, high oxalate, low citrate, that kind of a thing. Um, if you have high enough urine volume, and we see this in many of our patients, we can actually sometimes compensate for those other factors that we're never able to get down to normal levels. So this is really an important thing, and this is actually the one thing in diet that there's a lot of evidence for in stone prevention. So in, in counseling patients, when um, I'm looking at your low urine volume, which about 50% of our patients have, first I want to find out why that is. Do they just not feel thirst? This is actually kind of common. Do they have a job? Um, where maybe they can't get away to drink, and so they're censoring their drinking? Do they have urinary incontinence? So they're purposely not drinking throughout the day. Um, so, or sometimes it's simply because they only think that water counts. And this is something that I think we contribute to, because sometimes we tell patients, you just gotta drink more water. And some patients take that really literally, and they, and they begin to take, uh, they begin to think that that's all they can use to increase their urine volume, and that's not true at all. In fact, all beverages contribute to urine volume. Even foods with high water content, fruits and vegetables, for example, and some people can contribute up to 30% um, of their urine output. So we can ask patients to increase their urine volumes in different ways by expanding their fluid repertoire and, of course, by addressing the challenges that they face. And something I think that is interesting um, in upcoming strategies for increasing fluid intake, um, this was actually not a study in stones, but this was a study where they actually wanted people to increase their fluid intake for other reasons. And they found that the best strategies fell into these four categories. Self-monitoring tools, so giving patients things like dipsticks so they could actually measure their specific gravity throughout the day, or in some cases their urine pH, although that doesn't have much to do with urine volume. Um, another category of best practice this is, if you will, were specific instructions to patients, having them schedule their fluid intake. I use this a lot in patients. I say, let's make a schedule. Let's put all the hours of the day on there, and let's, let's decide how much you're going to drink by a certain period of time. And then another category of best strategies was using self-efficacy tools like drinking containers. Um, and then another one is education, making sure that patients understand what to expect and what the benefits might be. Um, that seems uh, to work in many cases. And I want to point out that one of our former fellows actually just received R01 funding from the NIDDK to explore something she's been um, exploring with um, some engineering folks on her campus at Penn State. It's actually a, a gadget, if you will, that um, when you lift it to your mouth, it actually – um, is connected to some cute, uh, you know, computer and, and sort of uh, your Fitbit and so forth, and it actually can sort of chronicle how much you might be drinking. And it's a really neat uh, little thing that might work for some people. There's also um, a PUSH study going on. PUSH stands for, um, let's see, stone, uh, I forget, prevention of urinary stones with hydration. And this is a multi-center study. Another of our former fellows is part of this, Sri Sivalingam at Cleveland Clinic. And they're recruiting patients now and uh, putting them through, um, you know, an education program, giving them a smart water bottle, which is also connected to a computer, and trying to find out if that increases fluid intake. So I think the, line, the story is going to be that something, there's going to be something for everyone. Um, just moving back here for a minute, what we did recently was we actually did something very, very low tech, and we actually had patients put these rubber bands around their wrists, and we had them put five of these around their wrist every morning, and then they were to take one off when they finished drinking a water bottle or a container full of fluids that we gave, uh, we gave them containers. And this actually worked for some people who didn't really like the tech sort of stuff. So you don't have to get high tech, um, but you do have to figure out what works for each person. Um, I want to move next into some of the other common risk factors, one of which is, of course, hypercalciuria. And this is a, a flowchart that Dr. Nakata and I developed for a publication we did some years ago now, but I still think it's useful. And what it starts with is actually the question, is there a dietary cause? Because as we know, as I just pointed out, there could be other causes for a person's hypercalciuria. And of course, if there's no dietary cause for it, and sometimes there isn't, then no dietary fix is going to work. And of course, then you should be exploring other options and other etiologies. But 
let's say you decide diet does play a role, well then at the bottom here I show all the possible things that could be contributing to hypercalceria. The most common, of course, being high salt intake, which expands extracellular volume, although not everyone has that response to salt intake. And, and of course it can also induce calcium resorption from bone, which is something we don't often think about. So these are the two mechanisms by which high salt intake can cause hypercalceria. And then we also know that a high dietary acid load, moving over to the right here, is also a common risk factor because that also increases calcium resorption from bone and in that way contributes to hypercalceria. There are some other factors here that I will sometimes explore, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, in people whose salt intakes does not appear high, their dietary acid load does not appear high, um, and there's other things we can explore. But just looking at those two really common ones, the first one being the potential renal acid load of diet, or PRAL. Um, I think what's important, I think everybody knows that meats, uh, flesh foods, I heard uh, Dr. Best use the term that I've used before, anything with a face, um, these foods are all acidic. They're all acidogenic. They all uh, promote to uh, an increase of acid production in our bodies. And uh, our renal system handles this. It's its, it's way of uh, getting rid of acids and uh, maintaining homeostasis with respect to pH. So not only meats, though, contribute to high uh, dietary acid load. Grains are another very important contributor. So you can see the items I've circled in red here. Meats, grains, all grains, flours, breads, spaghetti, pasta, and then, of course, fish, and then to some extent cheeses as well. What you see in yellow are foods that have a, a net negative, meaning alkaline load, or have no effect at all. They're neutral with respect to acid base. And what I think is important to point out here is that in addition to fruits and vegetables, which are by and large very alkaline, milk and yogurt and non-cheese dairy products like kefir, these are all basically neutral. So I think sometimes we, you know, we confuse patients when we say stay away from animal protein, but then we say, but drink milk and eat yogurt. These are animal proteins too, right? Well, if we're concerned about acid load, we don't want to restrict milk and yogurt, but we might want to think about limiting grains and meats and cheeses. So there's a little bit more complexity, I think, to this story than most of us are usually thinking about. In terms of salt, um, you know, most patients don't think that they have a high salt intake. Um, they, say, they say, well, there must be something wrong with the laboratory. I see that there's a lot of sodium there, but I never use a salt shaker. What the heck? Well, you know, we knew that there were other causes of, of high salt intake. Um, all these things in the pie chart contribute to that. And actually, this pie chart was generated when we gave about 80 of our patients, this was some years ago now, food scales. And we gave them dietary records, and we had them keep very careful track of what they ate, and I had a dietetic intern do the, the laborious job of uh, nutrient analysis and figuring out where the salt was coming from. And that's how we generated this pie chart, which tells us that the majority of our salt intake, up to 85% or even more, comes from, the, from non, from, not from the salt shaker, but from other foods. So the biggest contributors are processed meats and lunch and meats, breads and baked goods, a huge contributor of salt to the American diet and then all these other foods as well. So this is helpful in counseling because I can assure patients that I believe them, that they never use a salt shaker, but that indeed their salt intake may be high. And of course we can see that in the urine. So what to do? I guess this is really the, the question then. Um, what I wanna say, and you'll see me repeat this throughout the talk, is think about balancing the equation, not necessarily by limiting foods, but by compensating for the intake of those foods with other foods. So let's talk about high dietary acid load for a minute. Maybe we don't have to limit those acidogenic foods if we can compensate with simply more uh, alkaline foods, foods that have bicarbonate precursors like fruits and vegetables. So in, in some of my patients, men particularly who don't want to give up their you know, meat sandwich and their meat at dinner, then if I can simply get them to eat more fruits and vegetables, we can compensate for that acidogenic load. Um, and then also be specific. If we want them to limit foods, let's be specific that they're not limiting all foods, but maybe some meats, maybe just smaller portions, maybe some grains have to go. Um, and certainly not all protein is bad, as I just pointed out. So I think we need to think about this equation and both sides of it rather than just simply focusing on the one that says limit this, limit that. Dietitians hate that when patients come to us and say, I was told I couldn't eat all these things, and then we try to figure out ways to help them eat those things. What about salt? Let's say you have a person who you know, simply can't give up that, 
that uh, ham sandwich at lunch for whatever reason. Well, maybe that's fine. We help them uh, eat that every day by making sure that the rest of the meals of the day are very low salt. And a dietitian can help patients work through this. But again, thinking about both sides of the equation. Let's not just say, let's stop eating salt. Let's say, well, let's have the salt then at one meal, but then the other meals can be lower in salt. Same way with within a week. Let's say a person has to go out for pizza every every week, once a week. Fine. Then maybe, you know, the week, uh, thinking about the week, I guess I have these mixed up here, but let's think about the week in terms of being um, many different days and have um, parts of the week be um, salty and then other parts of the week be very, very low in salt. So, again, two sides of the equation. I want to come back to that concept, but I'll move on now to high urine oxalate, which is another problem we see. It's not as common as hypercalciuria. And actually, in all patients who form calcium oxalate stones, probably 20, maybe 30% of them have high urine oxalate as the cause for those calcium oxalate stones. And I say this because it's not necessarily necess necessary for, for us to say limit oxalate in all patients who have calcium oxalate stones. If oxalate isn't the reason for their calcium oxalate stones, then no amount of manipulation of that factor in their diet is going to cause, uh, is going to have any effect. So I like to think about um, the same question, hyperoxaluria, is there a dietary cause? There usually is, but sometimes there isn't, and we should be cognizant of that. Let's say we think there is. Look over on the left here at the bottom. I take these two things and I sort of consider them as one. Does a person have a high oxalate diet or do they have a low calcium intake? And I tend to think of these two together as, as, uh, um, as Dr. Best was saying last week, um, oxalate is not necessarily um, bad because it's contained in very healthy foods. So even though we don't need it and we have to excrete it, we can compensate for it. And dietitians do this all the time. We talk about bioavailability. We want to increase the bioavailability of many foods and many nutrients, and we have ways to do that. But in the case of oxalate, we want to reduce its bioavailability. And we can do that very simply by coupling or pairing calcium with those meals that have oxalate in them. So uh, I think about these two together because if, if, if it's not appropriate to limit someone's oxalate intake, then let's simply maximize or optimize their calcium intake. Sometimes we know that malabsorption causes high urine oxalate and we can use the same trick. We can try to increase their calcium intake as a way to compensate for that. And then there's some supplements that provide either oxalate itself, like turmeric or cinnamon or other herbal supplements, or that produce, uh, that give precursors that make us produce more oxalate. That's what happens with vitamin C. We get a precursor to oxalate biosynthesis. And of course, when the body gets all it needs for vitamin C, which probably is maximum 100 or 200 milligrams a day, but when you're eating 1,000 milligrams a day from a supplement, then of course that's going to be degraded. And the end product of the ascorbic acid metabolism is oxalate. So that's why high supplementation of vitamin C can cause high urine oxalate. And then I also, there's growing attention to this other factor that can cause high urine oxalate, and it is uh, about the gut bi microbiome. It's having too few or too little uh, capacity in the gut for oxalate degradation by bacteria. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's go uh, through a couple of these in particular, starting with that um, gut microbiome. Uh, not what I wanted to start with. Where am I here? Starting with the gut microbiome. So if a person has a low fiber intake, that means that their intake of prebiotics is low. And it turns out that over evolution, uh, we have eaten progressively less and less and less fiber in our diets. And what that has done, now we realize, is cause perturbations in our gut microbiome. So when we don't eat enough fiber, we don't get enough prebiotics, which are the sustenance or the food for the probiotics that live in our gut, and then we end up with a very compromised uh, gut microbiome that has very little capacity to degrade oxalate. So I contributed to a study uh, by, with a couple of microbiologists recently where we actually were looking at which bacteria in the gut are most responsible for oxalate degradation. And much to everyone's surprise, it really doesn't come down to those oxalate degrading bacteria like oxalobacter formigenes that you've heard about. It actually comes down to other bacteria that work in networks, as you can see over on the right here, to degrade oxalate. And sometimes these networks are composed mostly of bacteria that don't even require oxalate for their growth and, and, and life, but they can use it. 
And so very interestingly, we think that the more diverse the gut microbiome, the more capable it probably is of degrading oxalate, whether or not a person has oxalobacter forbingitis in their gut. So kind of an interesting thing that a lot of people are now looking at. But let's talk about calcium because I have talked about this a lot. Dr. Best talked about it as well. You'll hear me say that I really am judicious when I recommend uh, low oxalate diets for patients. Why do I do that? Well, one reason is Dr. Nakata and I showed about 10 years ago that you really don't have to do that to lower oxalate. We took people with high urine oxalate, and uh, these are, uh, as you can see on the right, on the top here rather, <clears throat> everybody in this study had oxalate over 45 milligrams per day, and we actually then treated them with e either dietary changes alone, we had them drink milk with their meal meals or use cheese or yogurt with their meals, or sometimes we gave patients supplements as well. We said, do this, but also have a calcium supplement at your meal, because some of these patients were malabsorptive. As you can see, their urine oxalates were like 100. What happened after treatment? Everybody shifted to the left, as you can see down on the graph at the bottom here. Everybody's oxalate went down. Many people got their oxalate below 45 milligrams per day. But in the main, everybody shifted to the left. And this was simply with diet alone, no mention of oxalate restriction. Why not a low oxalate diet? That seems easy, right? Well, just cut out your oxalate intake. Well, fortunately, there was one study, and this is only one study that has ever studied this, uh, put people on either a low oxalate diet or a DASH diet, which is a diet that is actually quite high for oxalate, but it's low for salt. Um, you know, it's a healthy diet. And what they found was interesting. They found that uh, people on the low oxalate diet had a lower intake of that fiber that I was talking about just a minute ago, so lower intake of prebiotics, a lower intake of phytate, which is a, a calcium stone inhibitor, a lower intake of bicarbonate precursors, fruits and vegetables, a lower intake of magnesium and antioxidants. They then had lower urinary excretions, as you can imagine, of phytate, of citrate, and of magnesium. They had lower urine pH, meaning that it was tending to be on the acidic side, and they actually had higher urine calcium excretions. Why is this? Because if you think about the way that calcium binds with oxalate to reduce the absorption of oxalate, it's the same in reverse. Oxalate reduces the absorption of calcium. And so sometimes if you limit oxalate and you don't limit calcium, you end up with this high urine excretion of calcium. Interesting. And then they found that both groups actually had about the same risk for calcium oxalate stones because even though the low oxalate diet reduced low oxalate, they ended up having a higher urine supersaturation for calcium oxalate stones because of all these other things I just talked about. So that's why I am judicious about limiting oxalate in the diet. Plus, I know that the foods highest in oxalate, which I'm showing here on the left, from highest in oxalate to lowest in oxalate, or lower in oxalate, I should say, these are also the foods that are highest for magnesium, highest for fiber, and highest for alkali potential. So I don't want to limit these foods if I don't want, if I don't have to. And if I can, again, think about that scale and manipulating that scale by instead of limiting these foods, maybe increasing the amount of calcium that people eat, especially with meals. And if people are lactose intolerant or they're vegan, not to worry. There are plenty of options that can accommodate all of these diets. And any dietitian uh, can help you with that. And also, I sometimes refer patients to the dietitians at high V stores. I don't know if anybody knows this, but every high V store in the country has a dietitian on staff. And dietitians are there to do grocery store tours and educate patients. And sometimes I actually tell patients to go to um, a dietitian there, and I give them a little prescription sheet about what I want the dietitian to talk with them about, and that can be really helpful. So, again, you see the two sides of the equation that I want you to think about balancing. Same with urine citrate. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute here, but with urine citrate, I want to ask the same question. person has low urine citrate. Is there a dietary cause? There may not be. They may be on topiramate, which is very um, uh, rampant these days, it seems like, and which really causes a low uh, urine citrate. So does the ketogenic diet, which some people are on for seizure control. So there could be non-dietary uh, causes. There might be dietary causes. We have that same uh, problem here with the high dietary acid load that I talked about a minute ago. What that does with respect to citrate is it causes the kidneys to reabsorb more citrate, which means there is less citrate to be excreted in urine. So that's why we get low urine citrate in diets that are high for acid load. Um, and that acid load could be caused by a low intake of fruits and vegetables. 
right? Think about both sides of that equation. If a person simply isn't eating enough fruits and vegetables, their diet is going to be high for acid load, and they're probably going to have lower citrate. Plus, many fruits and vegetables actually provide citrate, as we know, so that's a way of increasing your citrate. And then other people have diarrhea, which causes bicarbonate wasting. That causes, again, the kidneys to absorb or reabsorb more citrate, leaving less to be excreted. And then I'll talk about a couple of these other things later if there's time. So what can we do for patients with low urine citrate? If we think it's diet-related, well, then, of course, we want to try to address that with more fruits and vegetables. And we showed that uh, using lemon juice in water um, actually did increase urine citrate in our patients. And the bonus from that was also that they, also, they all had higher urine volumes, higher urine volumes, I should say, because probably we thought, we theorized that they were, you know, taking our recommendations and, and dissolving the lemon juice in water. And so their actual increase of fluid was higher. But all fruits and fruit juices and all vegetables and vegetable juices can contribute to urine citrate, not just lemon juice, not just lime juice, but also all these other things that have been studied. Um, there's also beverages that have organic acids in them. Um, some diet sodas and diet lemonades and things have other organic acids like malate and succinate and tartrate. These are also um, bicar bicarbonate precursors just like citric acid is. So um, some of these beverages have been studied. Um, coconut water is, as this person said, an unexpected source of urinary citrate. Um, diet sodas have also, uh, can also be used because of their organic acid content. And then, of course, diet lemonades and things like that. So I often recommend people to use these beverages in addition to water as a way to help meet their fluid intake needs, but also to increase their urine citrate. And again, talking about two sides of the equation, um, you know, try to balance their acidogenic foods with fruits and vegetables when you can, but recognize that for some patients, they're, this is not ever going to be enough. They, they are going to need medication, and we all see patients like this who we simply can't get them uh, to get their urine citrates higher, uh, high enough without using medication. But I often tell patients that if we do increase their fruit and vegetable intake, they may be able to be on a lower dosage of potassium citrate or some other um, alkali, which is often very attractive to patients, especially when those meds can be very expensive. Um, there's some other uh, non-pharmacologic uh, or dietary tips or ways to increase uh, urine citrate and also to alkalinize urine if that needs to be a goal as well. Um, Dr. Best talked about this last week, but we are looking at baking soda as a very um, capable agent for, reduce, for increasing urine pH and also citrate. It's been used for decades by um, nephrologists in uh, uh, people with chronic uh, kidney disease who have uh, very acidic urine. There's also some new products on the market. They're over-the-counter. They are not prescriptive. One of them is called KSP. One of them is called Litholite. We're studying this uh, actually in our clinic. And another is called Moonstone. And you can see I've listed the ingredients of all these things. They're combinations of different bicarbonates and citrates. And there's different ways that they come that is as ready-to-consume drinks, as powders, and so forth. And I think that uh, exploring combinations of these can reduce either a person's need for pharmacologic therapy or the, uh, the dosage required to, to achieve the desired effects. I want to talk for a minute about low urine magnesium. I don't think this is something we think about a lot, um, and I would say that this falls into the category of emerging knowledge. Um, we know biochemically that urine magnesium decreases the supersaturation of calcium oxalate. How does that work? Because in urine, magnesium complexes with um, oxalate and forms a soluble product. In other words, it stays in solution. And this uh, then, of course, remain, uh, uh, keeps uh, oxalate from binding with calcium. So there's kind of a twofold uh, way that magnesium in urine helps to reduce calcium oxalate stones. So we started looking at low urine magnesium a couple of years ago and looking at how patients, um, sometimes when they have low urine magnesium, they could also have low urine citrate, as we were, con we were interested and still are in the combination of these two things. And so we've been studying this in different ways. First of all, we took patients with low mag in their urine, and we supplemented them with magnesium. It's over the counter. It's not a medication. It's not a drug. Um, we found that we can very um, reliably increase their urine magnesium by using supplements. We also began to notice then that some of those patients 
also enjoyed or had increases in their urine citrate. And so now we're looking at the combination of those two factors. And as we study this further, we realize that the renal handling of magnesium and, and citrate are, kind, are related. They're linked. And so it makes biological sense that when you increase someone's urine uh, magnesium, you can sometimes also increase their urine citrate. Now, there's p patients who are resistant to this, and I think that's because they have other underlying issues, but we're exploring this and looking at how we can maybe use this in uh, therapy in more uh, reliable ways. And I want to point out, too, we're also looking at this. Um, PPIs reduce magnesium absorption, uh, like omeprazole. And we have a lot of patients on omeprazole. Just take a look sometime at the patients you're seeing and how many of them are on this. Um, and it's well known in the GI literature that this is a common effect of omeprazole. But what's not appreciated, I don't think, is that it can contribute to low urine magnesium. And we are looking at this, and we're looking at ways to uh, counteract this. And so hopefully in the future we'll have more information about this for you. Um, I also want to mention that there's some diseases that, cause, that, are nutrition, that have nutrition links, that if we address those diseases, we can reduce a person's stone risk. And one of these is diabetes. I think we all know that patients with diabetes have more acidic urine, and that's due to a defect in ammonia genesis. And so this really predisposes them to uric acid stones, which are caused primarily by overly acidic urine. And so a nutritional, uh, an aspect of nutrition therapy might be to actually help patients get better control of their diabetes. Because we know that when patients have lower hemoglobin A1C or better control of their diabetes, they tend to have higher urine pH. So maybe something that our patients with diabetes, we confer or, or refer to a dietitian who can help that patient control his or her diabetes better, and maybe that's the way we help them reduce their stone risk. So in the last couple of slides here, I just want to get to uh, some, some points that I like to always discuss. I want to make a, a distinction between nutrition therapy, which was what a dietitian practices, and dietary recommendations, which are what non-dietitians uh, do. In nutrition therapy, we always assess the diet. So I always spend time with a patient trying to find out what their habitual diet is. And there's different ways to do this depending on the person. Um, there's 24-hour diet recall. There's um, ways to look at their habitual patterns as opposed to specific um, meals. Um, there's many different ways to do it, but uh, we can assess a person's diet, find out with some degree of, of confidence what their, what their usual calcium intake, what their usual fruit and vegetable intake is, and so on. Then we want to look at their urinary risk factors and see if any of those can be accounted for by what we assessed or noticed in the diet. And then we diagnose that as dietary risk factors. And then, of course, we formulate our intervention and then monitor and adjust that therapy as needed. When we're giving dietary recommendations, generally we don't assess the diet. We're simply providing them a list of di desirable dietary habits according to guidelines. Maybe you're looking at the AUA guidelines and you're giving them a list of all those things. Um, what I think we need to realize is that the patient may already be practicing what is recommended, in which case you're not really telling them to change anything. Also, the, what we're telling them to do might not integrate with existing nutrition regimens that patients have in place for other comorbidities. And dietitians are always sensitive about this. I have a patient with, say, gluten intolerance. I'm going to make sure that my nutrition therapy is respectful of their needs to avoid gluten and so on. So I think the problem with dietary recommendations, uh, they're great, you know, great way to educate patients, right? But there's so many of them. Um, I've hidden them, but on the left here are, are many, almost 20 different dietary factors that could account for all of those common urinary risk factors that I just went through. It's a huge long list. And when we give patients these long lists, I can just see in their heads, you know, oh, my God, you know, how can I change all of these things? I think it's impossible. Imagine yourself. Imagine being told you have to change all these different things in your diet. I think that's really daunting, and it does not portend well for patient compliance. Plus, as I just said, they might not need to do all of those things. So if you're giving dietary recommendations, I think we should try to always understand how do you know diet is involved? Do you have a good reason for thinking that? Number two, how do you know which aspects of the diet are involved? Do you have a good reason for thinking that, that certain things might be involved? Um, it's usually safe to recommend higher fluid intake, higher fruits and vegetables, and to say to not limit calcium. Those are usually safe to give. But going beyond that, I think, can sometimes, whether you believe it or not, can cause harm. You can actually cause harm by telling somebody to lower their protein intake if their protein intake is already suboptimal. And I've seen this in some patients. So I, often, I also think it's important to remember that when we don't have 24-hour urines, I really don't know how you can discuss any specific risk factors. 
Um, but I see people do it all the time. I see people who form uric acid stones being told to advise uh, to, to lower their oxalate in their diets. Why? I have no idea. It just makes patients mad. And it makes them lose their faith in us when they do that. And then, of course, they keep forming uric acid stones. And so you control patients' beliefs. You, patients probably take you more seriously than me because you're a doctor. You're a medical doctor. I'm just a dietitian. So I think that we should recognize the power that we have to control patients' beliefs and their expectations. And remember that none of us know everything and that it's always appropriate to refer and to collaborate with people who are experts in things that we're not. So I really advocate minimally invasive, that's a term I borrowed from all of you, minimally invasive nutrition therapy, limiting the dietary recommendations to those which appear to be the most needed to have the most chance of affecting a person's stone recurrence risk, and then linking those changes to actual urinary risk factors so the patient can see what it is they're trying to control. We studied uh, whether patients uh, can remember dietary recommendations, and we found, um, this is in, in our stone clinic, we found that patients who received more than three recommendations had a much lower tendency to remember them, and they actually made stuff up. So when we called them a month later and said, what did we tell you, we found that if they received more than three recommendations, they started making things up that we didn't even tell them, and of course, they couldn't remember what we did tell them, and I think that, although we didn't study this, I think that has got to affect compliance. <laughs> if they don't remember what we told them, how can they do it? So in my prescriptive approach, I use a, a sort of a, a, a prescription sheet, if you will. I, I have all these different uh, sources of, of education or information on my, on my handout, but I will check the box for the things that I think this patient needs to do. And then the next patient might get a different set of check boxes and so on. So, um, and lastly, I just want to kind of want to go through, if you ever want to look at my notes, um, if you're seeing patients with stones and you want to see if I've seen them, you can search by my name, by my last name. It's always there, even if I've seen the patient in a multidisciplinary setting. And the anatomy in my notes are really simple. The beginning, the top of my note is always going to be background stone history. Uh, it's going to be their medical history, stone composition if we know it, uh, urinary risk factors. I might even create a little table like this, which I do a lot, where I show you the person's prior urinary risk factors. And then the rest of my note is going to be the medical nutrition therapy part. So this is where you're going to see my assessment. I've looked at the patient's diet. I've assessed it. I've diagnosed it with specific nutrition risk factors. You probably can't read this, but these are specific things. Excessive mineral intake. This person was supplementing with a lot of calcium. They were supplementing with um, uh, – they were eating a lot of salt. They were not eating up fruits and vegetables. These are my nutrition diagnoses. And then you will see following that is my intervention. Each one of my intervention points addresses those diagnoses that I identified earlier. So if you want to look at the anatomy of my note, um, that's what it is. And sometimes you can get some good information from looking at those. So I'm right at time, I think. And so I want to thank you all for your interest in diet. A lot of you have expressed interest in prevention with diet, and I really appreciate that among all of you. So thank you very much.